Hello, everyone. Welcome to topic 3.10, Shaping a New Nation. Our two objectives for this topic are going to be um, to explain how and why competition will intensify among people and nations from 1754 to 1800, but also explain how and why political ideas, institu institutions, and party systems develop and change the new republic. And we're really going to focus mainly on the presidential administrations of George Washington, but also John Adams today. So for Washington's presidency, and you can put this in the box that's just labeled Washington on your reading um, packet, okay, your unit packet, um, the big picture here is that the nation's existence was not guaranteed, okay? When Washington enters office, he's going to be the first president of the United States under the new constitution, and things were looking bad. And the federal government did not necessarily have as much power as it needed in the past. We are in financial crises. Um, other foreign nations are definitely threatening us with their power for sure. And it's not a guaranteed success that this country is really going to work at this point. Members of the first Congress are going to be elected in 1788 under the new constitution. And they're actually going to have their first session in New York City, which is a temporary capital of the United States at this time. Washington is going to be unanimously elected president. We discussed this a little bit last class. And he's done so, I don't want to say unwillingly, but he certainly wasn't fighting for the position. He was elected unanimously because he was a decorated war hero, right? Clearly somebody who's liked by both sides or both parties, whether it's the, the anti-federalist or the federalist when drafted the constitution. And he's kind of like thrust into this position, even though he'd probably just rather retire. They decided to organize the federal government um, in the following ways during the first presidency. So the first way that we see the federal government organized is through executive departments, which is in the left hand um, column of this box. OK, the executive departments that you have listed there are the secretary of state, secretary of treasury, secretary of war and the attorney general. So Thomas Jefferson is going to be our Secretary of State in this first presidential administration. Alexander Hamilton will be the Secretary of Treasury. Edmund Randolph is going to be the Attorney General. <clears throat> and Henry Knox is going to be the first Secretary of War. The federal court system is going to be put into place when the Judiciary Act of 1789 is signed. And when it's signed, it establishes the Supreme Court, which is going to act as the judicial branch of our federal government. And what they get to do is they kind of, at this time, they get to decide the constitutionality of the state courts, okay? Um, they get to look at some of the decisions of the state courts, okay? They'll have one chief justice and five associate justices, and they're going to add 13 distinct courts and three circuit courts of appeals. So we really just see that the Supreme Court is the Supreme Court of the land, right? And then underneath them, are going to be the 13 district courts and the three circuit courts of appeals. Those are still a part of the federal judicial branch. We just typically don't talk about them as often. I find that you more hear them in the news or you hear them when you're covering Supreme Court cases and they say like, oh, like this case went through this circuit court of appeals and then it wound up at the Supreme Court being the highest court in the land. All right, so for Hamilton's financial program, the United States um, economy at this point is a total mess, okay? It was not in good shape. The um, government under the Articles of Confederation could not tax the states. They needed to pay back debt to foreign governments. And Hamilton devises a plan to fix it, okay? And the first part of this plan was to pay off the national debt at face value and have the federal government assume the war debts of the individual states. So Hamilton basically says like, hey, states, give me your bills that you owe to foreign nations. I'll pay them off. It's fine. Okay. This is a really relatively controversial part of the plan because a lot of Southern states had actually paid off the bulk of their debt already. And they feel like they're getting cheaped out on this deal. And the second part of this plan was to protect the nation's infant industries and make revenue by imposing high tariffs on imported goods. So what this means is Hamilton's deciding to put tariffs into place on mostly manufactured goods at this time, okay, and other imported goods as well. But again, we know most of the stuff we are importing in the United States, which were once, which were once the 13 colonies, were not necessarily manufactured. That had been England's job in the past. And his goal is that putting these higher tariffs or import taxes on these manufactured goods, that will force 
and the economy of the United States to become more industrial and to produce manufactured goods rather than just growing agriculture, okay? Um, again, this is kind of seen as something that might favor the North too, as they are more industrial and less agrarian. <clears throat> and then finally, his third part of his plan is to create a national bank to deposit government funds and print bank notes to stabilize the United States currency at this time, okay? Um, previously to this, we had different states that had a variety of different currencies. Um, they were printing money at their own accord, which was causing inflation. This national bank would standardize everything to make sure that there's a system that will keep the economy afloat. Anti-federalists, um, as you could imagine, especially because many anti-federalists do come from the South, they really do not like this plan. They feel like it is giving the government way, way, way too much power, okay? They feel like the government's paying off debt, okay? They're favoring um, industries and imposing tariffs onto American citizens at this time. They're creating a bank that they and like wealthy investors are going to have control over, and they're afraid that it's going to create an unhealthy alliance between the wealthy and the government and that it's just going to make the federal government too powerful as a whole. So this financial program ultimately though, although the anti-federalists do not like it, it is going to be passed, okay? But there are some caveats. Hamilton did have to bend and appease the anti-federalists to get this to pass. For the debt assumption, <clears throat> meaning this first part, um, he decided to kind of like meet them halfway and decided to move the capital from New York City to Washington, D.C. And the reason why that appeased the anti-federalists is because many of them lived in the South and they felt that they would have more influence in the federal government if they lived closer to the federal government and the federal government was closer to Southern people. The bank, OK, um, is going to be privately owned. All right. And the federal government is just going to be a major shareholder, but it won't necessarily be the outright owner of the bank. So there are individuals that will own the Bank of the United States and the federal government just has a lot of stake in it. So that was a caveat that they put into place as well. So those are kind of the ideas of the financial plan. Again, the supporters of this plan are going to be Hamilton and the Federalists. The opponents of this plan are going to be the anti-federalists as a whole. All right, so foreign affairs um, under Washington. And I believe I actually, yeah, I did go over kind of like the idea of debt, right, and the National Bank. So those are the two things that you can kind of put at the end of the, the first big grid and first big box. So foreign affairs under Washington. Um, we'll kind of start with the French Revolution. So for the French Revolution, Americans generally supported the French Revolution. The French helped us in our revolution. But they are concerned with the violence of the French Revolution. Many people are losing their heads in the reign of terror. It does seem relatively chaotic and unstable. And Americans are concerned that if we get involved with the French Revolution, some of that sentiment could occur here at home as well. OK, um, technically, we do still kind of have and this is really the interesting part. We as the American people have a an alliance with their monarchy, not necessarily the revolutionaries. It's their king who helped support us during the French Revolution. And we kind of still have that link through the French monarchy with them. Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, he very much wants to join the war. And as a secretary of state, he does have a good say and sway in that. Um, he especially wants to join this war and the French Revolution because the British were impressing our ships, meaning that they were taking American vessels that were being used for trade, they were capturing them, and they were adding them to their military that was fighting in the French Revolution at this time, okay? And the British were kind of involved in the French Revolution as well. We are going to see um, a proclamation of neutrality that takes place, Washington knew that the United States was not strong enough to engage in a European war. And so what he decides to do is just declare that the United States will stay neutral. They are not going to get involved in the conflicts because we really have no leg to stand on in supporting the French people. And Jefferson does wind up resigning resigning as the Secretary of State in protest to, to this decision. Citizen Genet, that's kind of an interesting story. We have Edmund Genet, who is the French minister to the United States. So he's the ambassador from France to the U.S. He actually appeals this proclamation of neutrality directly to the American people. OK, so he comes to the U.S. He is kind of like talking about how he disagrees with this. And he is saying it directly to American spaces. And Washington is super, super angry over this. OK, he feels like he has somebody from France 
France, excuse me, coming in and intervening in our own affairs over here. Okay. Um, Washington actually had him recalled from his position. Okay. They kind of kicked Janae out of his office as the minister, but he does <clears throat> stay in the country and he eventually does become a U.S. citizen. So it's kind of just an interesting story there. The Jay Treaty. So the Jay Treaty is going to happen in 1794, and the Pickney Treaty is going to come after that, and the Pickney Treaty is going to be passed in 1795. So Jay's Treaty, what it was. We have the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Jay. He is going to be sent to Britain for two issues. One, he wants to discuss with them the impressment of American ships, that our ships are being stolen by them, and the occupation of U.S. coasts in the West, because the British did have forts still in the Western United States at this time, and they wouldn't necessarily leave. And we were getting really wary about that. Britain basically agreed to evacuate their posts in the West. So that's it. That's all they did. They just agreed to do it. We don't really see a lot of action where they are trying to get out, which becomes frustrating very fast. And this is going to be very narrowly passed by Congress, okay? It will anger American supporters of France because they feel like the British aren't really doing a good job at being an ally at this point to us when we are, you know, we are not necessarily fighting against them through France, okay? We feel like that the British should be a little bit more amenable because we're not necessarily helping their enemies, the French, at this time. OK, the Pickney Treaty, that is where Spain is going to decide to consolidate its holding in North America. So really, they're going to try and free up some land. They're going to open the lower Mississippi and New Orleans, Louisiana to American trade. OK, so we will now have access to the Mississippi River and New Orleans, which is going to flow into the Gulf of Mexico. And that will be a lucrative trading post for us. We're also going to see the right of deposit that's going to transfer trade in New Orleans <clears throat> without paying duties necessarily, meaning we don't have to pay taxes if we are using those trading ports. We kind of get free trade in that area. This is going to make the 31st parallel officially Florida's northern border. So really what the border is going to be between Florida and Georgia at this time. So that's just another thing that's solidified and standardized through the both of these treaties. Okay, so what you guys are going to do at this time is you are going to stop and answer the following questions that are on your um, unit packet or your reading guide at this time. It asks you um, why Jay's Treaty was so offensive to some, and then also what was the long-term impact of the Pickney Treaty? And you have the two boxes that you can just fill in there and get that sort of done and over with. So you can pause the video at this time. You can fill that in thinking about what you've already taken down, and then you can resume the video when you're ready to so some domestic concerns under Washington, the first of which is going to be American Indians or Native Americans or indigenous people, right? As Americans are moving west more and more that we have this land, we're allowed to chart now. Um, Natives are going to be resisting encroachment on their land by forming confederacies, where we see that multiple tribes band together for mutual protection. The Shawnee are going to do this. The Delaware are going to do this. We've seen the Iroquois Confederacy in the past. And there are others that band together. So we even have some of these greater confederacies that existed before come together in even larger ones now. Um, they're going to band together under the chief of the Miami tribe, Little Turtle, and he is going to have, and they are going to have pretty early success, okay? Um, they're going to be able to effectively defend themselves. They're going to prevent Americans from encroaching on their land. And we actually find out later, which will lead to the War of 1812, that the British are actually supplying Native Americans with weapons, okay, to a fight to fight us as Americans at this time. They kind of wanted to still stick it to us after the American Revolution, so they give Native Americans weapons to fight us in combat, okay? General Anthony Wayne, he is going to defeat this confederacy of tribes at the Battle of Fallen Timbers, okay? The Treaty of Greenville, that is where the natives are going to surrender claims to the Ohio Territory, and they promise to open it up to settlement for Americans to come over and to inhabit. So they do lose that piece of land as a result of the um, this war and these battles. All right, the Whiskey Rebellion is another important event that happens under the Washington administration. So the Whiskey Rebellion happens in 1794. This is where Hamilton is going to implement an excise tax on whiskey due to the reduced tariff for his financial plan, okay? So his financial plan, when he put those tariffs into place, the anti-federalists fought back and they decided to reduce the tariff that was there. 
Hamilton looks at that and he's like, well, I still need to get this money from somewhere. So why don't I, ta I tax, X uh, I tax whiskey, which is a kind of a sin tax anyway. He's trying to prevent people from drinking whiskey because when people drink, they get into trouble, right? Um, so he goes ahead and he puts this tax into effect to still get the money that he needs that he can't get from the tariffs. Anymore. Western Pennsylvania farmers, they love their whiskey and they are very, very annoyed about this, okay? And in fact, they refuse to pay it. He is going to challenge the effect of this of, or I'm sorry, the farmers are going to challenge the effect of this, of this new federal government, and they begin to attack the revenue collectors that are looking to <clears throat> collect this excise tax, okay? As a result, Washington decides that he cannot let this happen. It's reminding him of Shea's Rebellion. He feels like these Western farmers are testing the strength of a new federal government under his watch, and what he decides to do is he sends 15,000 state militiamen under the command of Alexander Hamilton to force the farmers to pay these taxes and to leave the tax collectors or the revenue collectors alone. And what they do is they show up with these 15,000 state militiamen and this show or flex of force is going to stop the rebellion with minimal violence, okay? We see that not very much blood is shed, nobody is going to die over this conflict and it is stopped very, very quickly, okay? And this event, the Whiskey Rebellion, really shows us the power of the new federal government under the Constitution, okay? A lot of the time, especially in this class, you will see that the College Board specifically likes to compare the Whiskey Rebellion to Shays Rebellion, okay? Shays Rebellion was not stopped easily under the Articles of Confederation, and it showed the weaknesses of that federal government. The Whiskey Rebellion is put down very swiftly and with little violence, and it shows the strength of the power of the federal government under the new constitution, okay? <clears throat> and that's how these two events kind of contrast with one another. Another good question just to bring up at this time is if a leader should be able to unleash the military on their own people, okay? Jack, uh, not Jackson, I'm sorry, George Washington and Hamilton are going to be highly criticized for this action, especially by Jefferson at this time. Jefferson feels like this is a huge overstep of government power and the power of the president to be able to unleash the military on his own people, very similarly to how King George did during the American Revolution. Okay, so some domestic concerns under Washington, this is going to be the section that you can take down for Western land. So the Public Lands Act is going to establish orderly approaches for dividing and selling federal lands at moderate prices. And this is meant to encourage settlement further west. They want people to kind of move about the country and populate these different places. There is going to be a process for adding states to the union that is becoming more utilized. So as these places become more and more populated, they will write state constitutions, they'll file for statehood, and then await approval from Congress, okay? Um, some new states that we do see pop up at this time as a result of the Public Lands Act are going to be states like Vermont, Kentucky, and Tennessee, okay? So they are just going to kind of pop up here, pop up here, rather. You have Kentucky here, you have Tennessee here, Vermont is up here, it kind of splits from New Hampshire at this point. Okay, the first political parties of the United States. So we had talked about the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists before. They are kind of the precursors to these two first really truly established political parties, okay? The Constitution didn't necessarily mention political parties and the framers did not Oh, sorry, they did not think this would develop. And they were so, so wrong, okay? They kind of just thought there was going to be one political party and everybody would get along and life would be a lot simpler that way, but it's not how it happens practically. There will be debates between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists that were the beginning of our two-party system and a core feature of American politics. The 1790s are going to be referred to typically by the as the Federalist era. Okay, they're dominating politics at this time. Okay, these politicians are going to be presidents. We have George Washington, John Adams, who are Federalists. Um, these people support Hamilton and his financial plan. The Federalists really have the upper hand in the early years with the Constitution. The Democratic Republicans, however, are kind of the new rebranding of the Anti-Federalists. Okay, so they are going to, going to come about and they're going to be supporters of Jefferson and his more agrarian vision for the United States, okay? 
Um, Democratic Republicans also kind of believe, I mean, one, in an agrarian vision for the United States, but they believe in more state-based and individual-based rights over the rights of the federal government. The French Revolution is going to exacerbate the differences between these two groups, okay? The Federalists generally want to try and support the British in those conflicts because they think it's more strategic and advantageous. The Democratic Republicans, however, they feel empathy with the French revolutionaries and their cause to overthrow their monarchy. The Federalists are going to be popular in the Northeast, <clears throat> and they're going to want federal power, okay? The Democratic Republicans tend to be much more popular in the South and the West, okay, in these new uncharted territories, because they wanted states' rights. These are some characteristics um, of both the Federalists, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. This you can take down in your unit packet pretty plainly, okay? In terms of leaders, John Adams and Alexander Hamilton are your big Federalists. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison are your big Democratic Republicans. In terms of views of the Constitution, Federalists are going to interpret the Constitution loosely, meaning they don't see it as completely literal or do or die. It's open to interpretation. They also believe in a strong central federal government. The Democratic Republicans, they have a much more strict interpretation of the Constitution. So, for example, if the Constitution does not say anything about the president having a power, he cannot just think he has that power. OK, that's really left up to the states or the people. And Democratic Republicans are going to try and create a weaker central government or weaker federal government. Federalists are definitely more pro-British when it comes to the French Revolution. Democratic Republicans are more pro-French when it comes to the, uh, the French Revolution. In terms of military policy, Federalists want a large peacetime army and navy, where Democratic Republicans want a small one. The Federalists believe that this should be in place to always be vigilant and keep us safe where Democratic Republicans do not think it's necessary and it gives the government too much power. Economic policy, Federalists would like to aid businesses, create a national bank and support high tariffs to bolster American industry. Democratic Republicans favor agriculture, they, they oppose a national bank and they oppose high tariffs. And then chief supporters of the Federalists are going to be Northern business owners and large landowners, where chief supporters of the Democratic Republicans are going to be skilled workers, small farmers, and plantation workers. So if you still need to pause this here and take some of these down, please feel free to do so, and then you can continue the video when you are ready. I just like to kind of throw this in here at this time, although it's not necessarily in your packet, just so you guys kind of understand how the evolution of United States political parties work. This will come back throughout the year, and I try and create a system where it makes sense for you guys. I also would try not to, and I know this is difficult, think of any of these early parties as aligning with Democrats or Republicans today, okay? Because it is very different we do see some similarities and some differences with Democrats and Republicans today, but it's not really one size fits all like you might think it would be. So just kind of think of them as in the past and having their own allegiances to different things. Try not to pro project today's politics too much. on it. So when writing the Constitution, the two political parties are going to be the Federalists who support the Constitution and the anti-federalist who believes it gives the federal government too much power, and they recommended that a Bill of Rights was added to protect American citizens, okay? This is in about 1788 that these two both exist, okay? Eventually, once the Constitution is signed and passed, the anti-federalist will really not be a term we use anymore, and instead, around 1972, they're going to kind of rebrand, and we'll be referring to this group of people as they evolve as Democratic Republicans. OK, so during the first presidential administrations, these are the two political parties that we find Federalists supporting Washington and Hamilton and Adams. OK, Democratic Republicans supporting Jefferson, Madison. And others. The last thing that you guys are going to have in your packet here is Washington's farewell address. So at the end of every presidential administration, <clears throat> the president kind of gives like a goodbye speech. OK, and Washington's farewell address um, kind of transcends time for a lot of reasons. OK, um, so I want you to write down his warnings, what might have caused those warnings. So you might have to think back to some of the content in this video a little bit and then just kind of write down the two term tradition and the 22nd Amendment as well. OK, so that's really what we're going to put there. 
This is going to come back up a bunch throughout the year, so please, please, please note this, all right? When Washington gives this address upon his departure, he warns the country of a few things. One, he states that we should not be overly involved in foreign affairs as it creates conflict and does not do much good for us as a nation. Two, he believes that we should avoid permanent alliances with other nations, okay? Three, he <clears throat> argues that political parties are divisive. If you have the Democratic Republicans and the Federalists yelling at each other all the time, not a lot's going to get done. And he really had to listen to that quite a bit with Hamilton and Jefferson in his cabinet. And he does warn about the sectionalism that does exist in the United States at this time, okay, that the North and the South are becoming much more divided and that the country is acting more divided or as if it's like two parts or if it's 13 different states than it does as one cohesive nation. Washington is going to leave office after two terms. And that's what we kind of refer to as the two-term tradition, because Washington never really wanted the presidency. It was something that he was thrust into, and he did not want to be a monarch. And he was very conscious of that throughout his entire presidency to try and not act that way. All presidents are going to follow Washington's two-term <clears throat> precedent until FDR, meaning that every president after Washington, because Washington only stayed for two terms, they will only stay for two terms. It is not actually written into the law at this point that a president can only serve two terms, okay? The 22nd, of, sorry, the 22nd Amendment is eventually later down the road in this course where we have the two-term limit, okay? So most presidents give up the presidency in the name of the Constitution and not being monarchs. They don't necessarily have to be forced to give up the presidency. So think for yourself what would have caused each of these mornings and make sure you kind of have that down in that middle box. The last part of this chapter, and I know this one was a bit long, is going to be the Adams presidency. So for John Adams, he is going to be in office from 1796 until 1800, and he will run for the Federalist Party in the election of 1796, okay? While Tom, Thomas Jefferson is going to run for the Democratic Republicans. And this is a pretty cutthroat race for the most part. Um, and they do go up against each other and argue to a great extent. Adams is going to win by three electoral votes, which is a pretty slim margin. But Jefferson is going to become vice president because of what was stated in the Constitution. OK, and that bears the question who thought this was a good idea. All right. Because the way they initially wrote the Constitution was that second place for the presidential election would become vice president. And we have Adams, who is a Federalist, and Jefferson, who is a Democratic Republican, are now going to have to work together for an entire presidential term. That, guys, is like Donald Trump winning the presidency and Hillary Clinton becoming his vice president. That would be wild, and it probably wouldn't go very smoothly. Eventually, the 12th Amendment will be passed in 1804, and the president and VP would then start to run on the same ticket together. The XYZ affair is one of the first issues that John Adams is going to have to deal with <clears throat> as president, okay? Um, what's going to wind up happening is that impressment will still be occurring, and Adams is going to have to send a delegation to negotiate with the French, okay? They want to be like, hey, look, like the British are impressing our ships <clears throat> through the French Revolution. The French are impressing our ships through the French Revolution. You guys are fighting each other through us and through stealing our cargo because you don't want your enemies to have access to our trade. But we, as Americans, need this to stop, okay? Ministers known as X, Y, and Z, that's what they gave their names as at this meeting, they requested bribes for negotiations and the United States refused to pay them. But Americans were super mad about this. They felt like the French were not acting in good faith and were not acting as good allies. Adams will still resist war over this, despite Federalist pressure. Okay, um, Federalists are still very much saying that we should declare war against France and to aid Britain a bit in this conflict at this time. This is an Electoral College map of the Jefferson and Adams race, which occurs in 1796. Just to give you an idea of how the nation is voting, we see Federalists mainly, again, are going to exist in the Northeast, where we see Democratic Republicans are far more popular in the South and the West at this time. Okay, I'm actually going to have to pause here, and I'm going to resume this as a second part two video. There's only a couple of minutes left, but there's about to be a class change, and I need to kind of change logis logistics in here. So I'm going to pause. You guys can kind of end this video, 
And then you can pick up on the next one that is going to be on the same exact topic. So I apologize for any inconvenience, but I just have to go through these last two. Mm. I'm going to finish up, actually. Just kidding. Okay, I'm going to roll through this pretty quick, though. So the Alien and Sedition Acts, <clears throat> one of the last things on here for you guys, the Federalists are going to win a majority of both houses with their anti-French sentiment. OK, um, so they do find a lot more popularity than maybe the Democratic Republicans do at this time after the XYZ affair. Occurs, OK, that kind of helps. them. But the Alien Sedition, Sedition Acts do, they're going to restrict their political opponents with these acts. OK, so they purposefully target people who are speaking out against the Federalist federal government at this time, um, which are going to be immigrants and Democratic Republicans. So the first thing they pass is the Naturalization Act, which is going to make it um, which is going to move it from five years to 14 years to qualify for citizenship here in the United States. That made it much more difficult for immigrants that were coming here from France specifically. The Alien Acts are where a president could deport immigrants considered to be dangerous or detain them during wartime. And then finally, the Sedition Act is going to make it illegal for newspaper editors to criticize the president or Congress, and they would be punished with fines or imprisonment. So these first two target mainly French immigrants. This last one is really going to target maybe immigrants, but also Democratic Republicans speaking out against a federalist controlled federal government at this time. The question here, are these acts reflections of American and revolutionary ideals? Okay, that's something that you guys should be thinking about. And the answer is probably no, this is definitely going to be a violation of the First Amendment here. And we see that we are not treating immigrants equally with other citizens within the United States. The last thing I want to discuss very quickly is the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. So there's no judicial review yet. And what that means is that the Supreme Court is still kind of handling or overseeing state court decisions. And they are not at this time deciding if laws are constitutional or unconstitutional yet. OK, um, as a result, Madison and Jefferson are going to argue that a state should be able to nullify a law they find to be unconstitutional if they choose. Meaning, if like in the state of Kentucky thought that like the Alien and Sedition Acts were unconstitutional or like the Sedition Act is unconstitutional, they could nullify it or ignore it or make it void. OK, this is something that they believe they have and a power they believe they have that they don't necessarily have outlined in the Constitution. It's not super important now, but it will come back later, especially as we're inching closer to the Civil War. Can states just decide not to listen to something when the federal government does it? And in some cases, that actually leads to secessionist tendencies as well. So. What I need you guys to do is I just need you to stop and answer the following question. It says, John Adams is one of the most underrated presidents. I'd like you to support, refute, or modify um, the statement and just explain what your answer is and why, okay? After that, I would like you to do the SAQ practice. Remember, for SAQs, you need to have three sentences for each part of the question, okay? Practice that SAQ that is on your page. So I did indeed finish this video. I'm happy I did it on time. Um, and you guys can go ahead and you can read topics 311 next and then watch the video for that.